everyone and welcome to Quilt Stories. I'm Lisa Walton and today we're going to be chatting with Lee McComas who does some pretty incredible quilts and we're going to be talking about the quilt that's behind her and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing all about it. But we had a little bit of trouble getting started today, Lee. Do you want to tell us um, why oh. we had to think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I live in the mountains here in Colorado. Um, and I was preparing for this. I looked over my slides and everything was ready to go. And then just before I'm, I'm due to log on, you know, to our Zoom connection, my dog is scratching at my leg and um, she needs to go outside to do her business. And I thought, okay, we're going to do this really quick. We'll be ready to go. And there was a deer I didn't see in the front yard and she took up after it. And so, you know, my dog is only about 10 pounds and easily, you know, is a, like we call her a Scooby snack for um, mountain critters. And recently we've had bears and mountain lions in our neighborhood. So it was pretty critical that I find her um, because if I wait for her to come back on her own, she may never show up again. So I, you know, I was frantically calling my husband. We have a, his studio is nearby and he's running through the woods looking for her. Anyway, she's back home. She's safe and sound all well, as well. <laughs> I've never had a problem with deer in my front yard and I've certainly never had a problem with um, mountain lions. <laughs> Um, I'm really glad you found it. Okay, I'm going to um, start the screen sharing and right. have a look at the quilt. So this is the quilt we're going to be talking about today. It's called Crossing Over. And just before we start talking about the quilt and, and um, how you made it, I'd just like to share this photo with you. And would you like to tell me where this photo was taken of the two of us? Yes, this is you and I in Houston at the International Quilt Festival there. It was very exciting last November. Um, the piece that you see behind us is called The Long Goodbye. And I won the Superior Thread Award for uh, thread artistry and so and this is the second time that I've won this award but it's still just as exciting oh yeah um, and the piece we're talking about today I made as it was my follow-on piece to bike boys which I won the award with about five years ago and um, for some reason this piece doesn't it didn't resonate with the judges, but I love it. So um, when you gave me, you know, the chance to choose a piece and talk with people about it, I wanted to share this one because I just feel like I haven't gotten the opportunities to share it that I have with some of my other quotes. So right. here we have Crossing Over. And would you like to tell me a little bit about the inspiration for it? So this was my inspiration photograph. The History Colorado Center, which... They have an amazing archive of photos, historical photos from the American West. And um, I worked with the archivists there going through different photo collections for about four days and I chose 10 photos to do this whole series. And uh, this is one photo that I chose. It was a little more complicated than what I was ready to tackle. And surprisingly, there wasn't a whole lot of information. We're not sure exactly where this location is or who took the photo, but I thought it was, it was just a terrific photo to start working from. They gave me a high resolution digital scans of all the photos that I wanted. And then what I did at home, you can see I started breaking them up. And originally, this was gonna be a triptych. Together, there were gonna be four figures. Oh yeah, here it is. And I was gonna call it the Four Horsemen, but I never got the, the image on the left with the group of writers in it completed. And when I get the first two panels done, I realized that if I made the third panel, the whole composition was so large, it would be hard to find a place to exhibit it because it would be too big for most quilt competitions. It would exceed their maximum um, size limitation. Okay. So in the end, um, I just, didn't do it, haven't gotten around to it. And even as it is, the, the diptych that I have made um, has had limited places where I can show it. So one of the things I do is I put this in Photoshop on my computer and I play around with the lighting. Um, oftentimes it's too dark to reveal all of the detail you need. So you can see on the left was how the scan came in originally, but then if you look on the right side of the screen, you can see what it looks like um, when it's lightened. So this pattern, I'll do a couple of printouts. One that's darker so I can see details in the really light parts like his shirt. 
and then I'll do a, a light in the overall photo and sometimes that really blows out the light parts so you lose details in those but you gain detail in the darker sections I'll do a couple of printouts with it and then here's something I do when I'm I'm putting a composition together. I'm a big believer in the golden ratio and using it to position key elements of a composition and just, I did not take a photo of this when I was first doing it. So after fusing the first two panels, I laid them back down to, to try and illustrate what I was doing. What I do is I put pins along the top, the bottom, and the sides, uh, the golden ratio, or to make it easier, the rule of thirds. Mm -hmm. And then I connect pieces of string. And I'm looking for places where uh, to put lines of the composition or key parts of the composition on those diagonals or on the horizontals. So in the center panel, you can see the horizon line falls on one of the strings that goes across. The string across the bottom third kind of marks the belly of the horse. Mm -hmm. um, there's a diagonal that comes down and hits the elbow and then follows the curve of the blanket. It's a really nice place to meet, to make several elements of the composition fall in line. This is Coco, the troublesome dachshund. So um, she also, when I have things on the floor and I'm working on them, she comes and walks, moves my line. She's, if she wasn't so cute, she would be banished. But I wanted to um, talk with you about this. So you can see my color scheme. When I was doing the water, there's really two schemes at work. So one is a warmer blue-green and one is a cooler blue-violet. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to capture two things. With the lighter blue-green, I wanted to communicate the surface of the water and how it's reflecting the sun, the sky, the vegetation along the river. But then in the shadow of the horse, um, you can see down into the depths of the river, and that's where I went with that really cool color scheme. And so I start with some big blocks of fabric, um, and for this one, the batiks were really gorgeous. And then, so on the left, you can see how I cut out smaller and smaller little fussy cut pieces mm -hmm. to add accents or highlight. Everything's fused, so I do raw edge, fused applique mm -hmm. and then I'll stitch over the top of it so here you can see the water um, under one of the horses is completed and then over on the right there's just a slice of the the absolutely completed panel so it's got the horse so as as we're looking at the piece you can see across to the far bank and you get um, there's more atmosphere between mm -hmm. you what I'm doing is is making the value contrast less and less as you move off into the distance to account for atmospheric conditions and to give this sense of depth if you are seeing the same highlights and accents on the far river bank as you are right up close it, it wouldn't make sense to the eye and it would sort of Flatten. Okay. And um, another element that I really had to fuss around with uh, was the blanket in the photo because I was working from a black and white photo and I had no idea what the color scheme was. Um, so I started, I did a bit of research on Native American blankets to try and figure out what tribe this might have been and what typical color schemes might have been. I didn't find that really helpful. Okay. So, but I found some beautiful blanket pictures, but it was like, oh, that's not quite right. So I, I ended up settling and I did some drawings and then I color them with colored pencils to kind of see how things are going to work. And in the end on the right, you can see I went with a blue and red and white and gray mm -hmm. color scheme. So in the larger context, this on the left was that figure completely fused. And then you can see over on the right, um, the thread painting that goes with it. And that's where I really can add in the variations and values and get create this sense of contour and a sense of depth. And it also gives me a chance to add in some of the detail. Here was another problem I faced, the big butt. So I really love to take elements off the edge of my pieces, it's a great way to make those pop. And But when I did this panel, I didn't realize how much 
of the horse's back end was going to be hanging off. Once I got to the stage on the left, I realized it was going to be incredibly difficult to stabilize that. So my solution was to go in and extend the background mm -hmm. closer to the top of the tail. So you can see where that happened on the left. Yeah. And this yeah. was a little tricky because, um, you know, I was actually piecing it and it created a line. If, if you know it's there, you can go looking for it. Yep. I still know it's there, but... I don't know if anybody else does. We all do now. Another problem I ran into was the face of what I, I call the rear guard, the man that's moving away from you. Mm -hmm. um, it was just all one dark value. I tried lightening the photo, but I really couldn't get detail. And so, and I knew I didn't want to do it as one big dark gray blob. Actually, it was kind of creepy. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I had to create a face. Um, so I went back to my drawing that I have of just facial proportions and held this up next to it and then kind of put in pins at key places where I knew the bottom of the nose should be, where the eye line should be, basically the same value as the hair, just slightly off, but it does help to separate them. Yeah. And then when I did the stitching, I made that a little more noticeable. Mm -hmm. So it's still not a lot of detail, but at least I could uh, create enough of the face to make it a separate element from the hair. In the past, sometimes I've done uh, portrait quilts and I just put a big sky fabric in the back. And I, I felt like that those were opportunities for creativity that I had passed up and I wanted to do something with this sky. So I went back to the research I had done on Native American blankets and picked up some of the motifs and the patterns from those and I recreated them in the sky. And this, this is just made from cut out pieces of tool and um, I just put fusible on the back of them and, and then fused them down. Okay, what fusible do you use? There's two that I'll use. If I'm just doing applique and not doing a lot of really heavy stitching, I like the steam seam too light because mm -hmm. you can peel things up and move it around. Um, but when I'm doing pieces like this for competition and there's a lot of thread painting, I use Misty Fuse. Right. Because it's really thin, holds things down. And when I stitch and my needle heats up, it doesn't, the, the adhesive doesn't melt to my needle. So with, it's the only adhesive that I've used or fusible product I've used that doesn't create those little gummy wads. I call them, I call them fuse boogers on my needle. <laughs> while, we're, while we're talking about brands, what long arm do you have? Oh, I have a handy quilter, Avante. There it is. Yeah. So in order to make uh, the background kind of continuous, I thought it was a good idea that I put both of these panels on the long arm and then stitch all the way across both of them. I wanted them to be cohesive as I was stitching, but the problem I ran into, again, um, on the left you can see the tail. When I put those two panels together, the tail stuck up farther than my <laughs> long arm. So I had to do some problem solving there. I stitched everything but the tail and then eventually had to pull the whole thing off. I think that um, I extended the backing I, and then put that tail back over and then I had to blend the stitching. And in the right. end it all worked out, but it was... Yeah, so. but sometimes just doing that little extra bit is sort of what also makes the quilt. People yeah. really focus on it. So it's probably yeah, worth the effort. Right. One or two threads. Yeah, yeah, just a couple. So anyway, when I pick out threads for every element, I'll, I start with a set of five threads in five values. So light, medium, light, medium, 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 dark, dark. And then what I'll do, especially in these, these pieces I'm doing for show, is I'll create a, a second set of threads in five values that are slightly warmer and another set that are slightly cooler. So for every one of my values, I've got three different threads, a warmer, a cooler, and something in the middle. And I usually use cotton or uh, the spun poly. It looks like cotton. I don't really like the shiny fabric or the shiny threads much. Mm -hmm. But because these horses were in water, parts of them are wet. And that's where I threw in some of the, the shiny polys. So these are all the threads for one horse. For the bobbin, I use a bobbin fill. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to change those very often. I know some people are really sticklers for making the bobbin thread match 
what's on top, but I don't. So I like to use um, bottom line by Superior mm -hmm. and um, sometimes some other, like some 50, 60 weight threads so that I don't have to fill the bobbin as much. There, There's a few parts of the process that I really just hate. I just find it irritating. And one of them is filling bobbins. <laughs> so I just fill a whole bunch of them, light, medium, and dark. And then that's that's what you get in the back, filling bobbins. And I hate them. My husband is happy to help me do most things, but he uh -huh. will not help me baste a quilt. Oh, wow. So, isn't that weird? So who knows? Yeah. So when I'm stitching, because the process of doing, you know, posterizing and printing and doing an applique, you can lose a lot of details. And so what I do is on my long arm, I have a shelf that sits across and I have a laptop that sits there and I bring up uh, the photo that I was working from. And, and then I can see much of the detail that I had lost. Right. One of the problems I had was stitching this horse's face um, and his snout. So on the left was how I first did it. And when I stood back and looked at it, I just thought he looked like a, I don't know, like a duck billed platypus or something. It didn't look like a horse. It was too smushy. And so when I went back to the original photo, it's because the photo is blurred. The horse's head must have been moving when they took the photo. And so there was not good detail for it. So then what I had to do was I went online um, to Professor Google and ask what a horse snout should look like. And I found this picture on the left, somebody had done a drawing, but it was the most useful. What I did was put a piece of plastic acetate over my fused quilt that was on the long arm. So the red lines are the outline of the fabric as I had it. And then I practiced with a black marker uh, drawing kind of registration lines. Here's what direction my threads need, my stitching needs to go. So here's the original nose. There is the second version. I think it's a little better. Yeah, yeah. Um, you obviously haven't seen too many duckbill platypus, but that's okay. Oh, no, maybe that's, um, what does it, huh? Okay, yeah, I have it ever. <laughs> <laughs> As soon as this interview is over, I'm going to Google that. <laughs> they're, they're very cute. Yeah, so the next element I uh, focused on was mountains. They need to be really craggy. That's the kind of mountains that we have out here. But I didn't want to get bogged down in the detail of it. And what I found were these uh, batik fabrics that I used, where it just has kind of a crumpled looking design. Mm -hmm. um, was just a, a great reference. Yeah. So I just used the lines and the likes and darks in that fabric to stitch it. So on the left, you can see I started stitching the dark parts. And then over on the right, that's where it's, it's kind of, I'm blending in the lighter threads. That's the vast expanse of it. The back. So I gave this what's called an artist facing. I think there's a few different names for it. Um, so you can see how it's folded over, but you can imagine I do this incredibly dense stitching. There's layers of fabric. And when you try and fold that back and get it to lay down, it's um, not very cooperative. So what I do when I'm done with it is fold that back and press it. And then I take a hammer and pound it all along the edge to get it to flatten down. This is the back of where that tail was sticking out. And it was still a bit floppy. So what I have here is what's called horsehair braid. And it's used um, like in couture, in dresses to kind of stiffen the bodice. It also provides just enough body to keep that tail straight. So here I am holding it over the top, but in fact, that piece of horse hair is embedded inside the facing. When it's all done, I'm down to just two guys, can't call them the four horsemen. So the one looking at you, facing at you, I call the sentinel. And then the next one is called the rear guard. And there's this tail. And what I wanted was to create two pieces that could stand alone, mm -hmm. but that also go together. I really love um, the effect of the rug. And it's funny, I didn't see it. I was focusing on the figures. And until you mentioned it, I went, of course. And now they're really. Oh, they're... And it's it reflected in the water as well. Oh, heaven. Oh, yes, it is too. Uh, so, but it's a little ripply. And that was just completely done with stitching. There's a project that's pretty near and dear to your heart. Um, and I'd just like you to talk about it for a moment. It's the Border War Quilt Project. Quilt project. 
Yes, and it's really exciting. The issues around immigration, building a wall, has been another one of those issues that's really divided our country. And I, I found that really disturbing. I think it's important that we deal with this and find some really workable solutions mm -hmm. and that it, we should be able to talk about it with, without being hateful and without screaming and, and, and we should also be able to listen to each other. So the idea is that people create small works of art. So they're eight inches tall and 16 inches wide mm -hmm. and we call them bricks. And they're like mini art quilts. And you can say anything you want about immigration, US immigration policy, solutions to the immigration problem, how you feel about the wall. And then I collect them and put them together and create these big panels with ribbons that come down. So there's three inches between all the bricks. So if you were on one side of the wall, you would see a set of 30 bricks. I would be on the other side looking at a completely different set of bricks. And we could also see each other and hear each other talking mm -hmm. about the exhibit. So, so right now we are our sixth panel. Wow. Um, and we need just about 30 more bricks, and then we're going to stop there. We're hoping to have it done uh, before the end of this year. Um, and then we're looking for places to exhibit it. So I'm hoping maybe after the next election, in time, things will settle down and people will be willing to go back and take a look at it. Okay. What I found out that we have done has created a visual timeline over the last two years. Yeah. I mean, we went from, ooh, Mexicans, keep them out, to the family separation, and now we know so many immigrants are coming from even further south. Good luck with it. And um, the, all the information about everything we've talked about and links to products are in the description um, part of the YouTube, so please, please check it out. Do I have time to talk briefly about a project I'm working on? If you don't live in the United States, you may not know, and because it hasn't been that big in the news, this year, 2020, is the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote in the United States. And I, along with about um, 15 other fiber artists, have been commissioned to do works of art for a big exhibit called the Women's Voices, Women's Votes, Women's Rights. And it's being put together by the Clinton Foundation. And so I've been throwing myself into that. I'm doing probably the biggest, most complicated project I've ever worked on. And I'm just hoping that this virus settles down long enough to actually have this exhibit. It's already been postponed once. Um, it's set to debut in November, a week after our elections, mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm hoping it, it comes to fruition there. It should be really spectacular, and I believe that there are also plans for it to travel um, to Europe, to um, England, I believe, because um, they were certainly ahead of us in the women's suffrage movement. Mm -hmm. so. As it becomes live, and hopefully this yeah. video will be around for a long time. Um, yeah. that people will be able to go, oh, I heard about it ages ago. I hope you've enjoyed this video, everybody. I'd really like to thank Lee. Um, we've had some technical issues with this <laughs> video, so um, I'm very grateful for her time. Um, I'm hoping that if you enjoy this video, please click the subscribe button down below um, so that we can make lots more videos. I can't believe every day I keep thinking, oh, there's another person I want to talk to because I'm learning so much and I hope you all are too. Thank you so much, Lee, for, for your time yeah. today, sharing all your secrets. Um, I'm amazed at um, the level of detail and um, information about how you put your, your quilts together is fascinating and um, so far out of my comfort zone. <laughs> oh, well... I'm glad to share it with you. Right. And it's so fun to talk with someone from Australia. Oh, yes. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I hope to see um, your Hillary Clinton piece very soon. And awesome. good luck with finishing it in time. And I really, really hope that um, the world will settle down so that um, yeah. many other people can see it too. Bye for now. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>